organic compounds. Now we are on the verge of creating the first inorganic life forms after four billion years of evolution. And if, in, if we succeed in doing that, then we are really beyond the gods of ancient mythology that just managed to create organic creatures. Give us an example of things that we are either on the verge of or have already developed that points the way forward to yes. that world you're talking about in the book. So, for example, uh, if you think about brain-computer interfaces, connecting brains and computers directly, one to the other, this is something that is already being done. It's not science fiction. And this is the basis for connecting human brains to bionic limbs. Uh, we already have real humans uh, that uh, their brains are connected to artificial hands and legs and even eyes and ears. And they are able, to some extent, uh, to use these limbs in, in more sophisticated ways than uh, organic limbs have been used up to now. To give just one example, in an organic creature, all parts of the animal or the human must be connected to one another in order to function. If I sit here uh, in Boston, my hands must be connected to my body. If you disconnect my hands and place my hands in California, I cannot, they cannot function. But with a cyborg, with a brain connected to uh, inorganic limbs, uh, there is no limit. I can sit here and my legs and hands can be in California or on Mars and they can still function because the brain is connected to these artificial limbs via the internet. And uh, so space, the whole notion of being in one place all the time, this no longer is a limit for inorganic beings. Uh, people are killing their herds in parts of Somalia because there's no water for them and no vegetation for them to eat. Uh, there are people who are dying in various parts of the world for want of a dollar fifty worth of medicine. So while Jack Stewart of Wired flies a plane with a, a cap on his head, uh, I'm wondering whether this world that you're positing in Homo Deus reproduces the inequality of today in the future, where a tiny portion of the human race gets to transcend time and space in this way, while a lot of people, billions perhaps, are still very much bound by the realities of that old natural world. Definitely. I think that we have, if we, if we are not careful, then in the 21st century, we are likely to create the most unequal societies that ever existed in history. Because for the first time in history, it will be possible to translate economic inequality into biological inequality. In the past, there were many differences between the rich and the poor, between the nobility and then the common peasants, and the nobles always imagined that they were superior. They have superior abilities. This is why they are the nobility. But this wasn't true. There was no fundamental difference in the physical and mental abilities between the son of the king and the son of the peasant. However, in the 21st century, with the rise of new technologies, especially bioengineering, it might be possible to create superhumans, to create different biological castes, and to translate economic into biological inequality. And once such a gap opens, it is almost impossible to close it, because then the rich really will be more capable than everybody else. Or, conversely, could we use these technologies to close some of that gap if that was part of the policy design of how to use these wonderful inventions? Certainly, there is nothing deterministic about technology. We cannot just stop the march of technology, but we have a lot of influence about what to do with it. If you look back to the 20th century, then what you see is that the same technologies of the Industrial Revolution, electricity and trains and radio, could be used to create a communist dictatorship or a fascist regime or a liberal democracy. The trains and the radio didn't dictate to us what to do with them. You could use radio to have NPR, and you could use radio to have Hitler spreading propaganda to millions of Germans all at the same time. Or more recently, radio was used in Rwanda to tell people to go to the next village and, and massacre them. Yeah, definitely. So again, 
technology, it, it's often said technology is, is never neutral because it changes the world, but it, it's not deterministic. We always have choices what to do with it. We're talking about our future, the future of our very consciousness or humanity, our ideas about democracy and free will when we're wired to the cloud. And as a young guy, I, I promised to be married to my wife forever, but you know, forever I knew how to a sell-by date, that I knew it, I wouldn't be married still at 150 years old, but would a society have to think about what marriage is differently if people routinely were living to be 120? Definitely. I mean, I think that if we really expand human lives to 120 or 150, it will need rethinking uh, in almost all social and cultural and political fields. Uh, just think what it means to have, say, uh, Vladimir Putin live to be 150. We still have 90 years to go. Uh, actually, if people live to be 150, Stalin would still be alive today. In Moscow, ruling the Soviet Union, maybe. Uh, it certainly changes marriages. I mean, till death do us apart means very different thing if you expect to live until your 70s or if you expect to live until 150. Um, and also, I guess, at least at first, it won't be available for everybody, these new treatments. So you could, you could have extreme amounts of both anger and anxiety. Uh, anger from the side of the poor, uh, who won't have these new treatments to extend their lives. I mean, throughout history, death was the greatest equalizer. The poor knew that even though these rich people, they have it good now, in the end, they will die just like us. And this was some sort of comfort. But just think of a world in which the poor continue to die, but the rich live on, young and beautiful forever, or at least until 150. This will create immense amount of anger and rage. And on the side of the rich, I guess it will create immense amount of anxiety. Because, uh, you know, uh, we take risks all the time, because we assume we are going to die anyway. I came here uh, from Israel, it was a risk to take a flight, to take a train, but you know, I'm going to die anyway. But if you think you have a fighting chance of living maybe indefinitely, you will not be willing to take any risks. And uh, levels of anxiety, I mean, I don't know, Woody Allen would seem like the least neurotic person in the world compared to these rich people who know that if they are just if they'll just be careful enough, they can live indefinitely. I wonder also if we are fated, really sentenced, to having to always rush to keep up, whether machines are planting flags in the ground way down the road, where our laws, our social ideas, our emotional selves are always rushing to keep up. You mentioned in the book the three-parent child, three-parent child, which was posited and then done, and then only after it was done, people started to say, well, well what are we going to do about that? I mean, how are we going to act? Could it be against the law? What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that technology is now moving faster than politics. And for example, I was watching the debates of the presidential elections in the US uh, last year. And I was amazed that there was all this talk about the job market and, you know, Donald Trump frightening people that the Mexicans will take your jobs, the Chinese will take your jobs. He never said the robots will take your jobs, the AI will take your jobs, which is a much more frightening uh, scenario. That and much more likely. And much more likely. Um, it's very likely that within, you know, 20, 30 years, there won't be jobs for taxi drivers and bus drivers and so forth because everything will be just self-driving vehicles. And IBM's Watson and other uh, AI doctors will replace most human doctors and so forth. And we just have no idea what the job market would look like in 30 years. This is the first time in history when we really have absolutely no idea what will people do for a living in 30 years? Now, it's quite likely that there will be new jobs, but we don't know what they will be, and therefore, we don't know what to teach children today in school that will be relevant to the job market in 30 years. I guess most of what they learn at school today will be irrelevant 
by the time they are 40. And, you know, this is a, a crisis of immense magnitude. Dweebus writes, let me guess, perpetual progress. Ah, yes, he just said it, an inevitable march, upgrading ourselves, merging with smartphones. It is the singularity repackaged. I suspect the historian well knows progress is not guaranteed. Regression is possible. Life and technology are both dependent on a functional biosphere. Tech requires abundant, cheap resources and energy. Both the biosphere and the necessary resources are limited and compromised. Yuval Harari? Well, I think that utopia is definitely not inevitable and probably unlikely. But uh, an ecological crisis, which uh, we are already in the midst of an ecological crisis, is likely only to accelerate the technological pro progress uh, in fields like bioengineering and artificial intelligence. I, my guess is that uh, the ecological crisis will serve the same function as the world wars served in the 20th century of accelerating technological research and invention because these are high-risk, high-gain technologies. Yuval and Harari is with me in Boston. Our number is 800-423-8255. Hello, Kitty writes, I hope I die before any of what he's describing really takes off. I just want to be a living, organic thing. I have no desire to mechanize myself selectively or to try to develop relationships with half-organic, half-inorganic things. I think this is a very common reaction, that people say, I, I, I hope I will be dead by then. And this is a very authentic reaction, because what it really means deep down is that people understand correctly that the, the meaning of their lives their fears, their hopes, uh, will become irrelevant to a large extent in such a world. They just won't be able to find their place there. I think the greatest pressure on humanity, on humans, on individuals in the 21st century will be to constantly change, to constantly reinvent themselves, or else they will become irrelevant and, and stay behind. Previously in history, life was kind of divided into two main parts. In the first part of your life, as a teenager, as a young person, you mainly learned. You acquired knowledge, you acquired skills, you built an identity, a personal identity and a professional identity. And then in the second part of your life, you mostly made use of everything you learned as a, as a young person. And this will no longer work in the 21st century. The pace of change and the magnitude of change will be so big that in order to stay in the game, you will have to reinvent yourself, even reinvent your identity, even at the age of 40 and 50. And this will create immense pressure. And I, I sympathize with people who say, I just don't want to deal with such pressure in my life. Such pressure in my life. We'll go first to Nashville, Tennessee. Ty is calling. Ty, welcome to On Point. Thank you for having me. What's on your mind, Ty? So, for, for, um, for example, I'm 21 years old. I'm a millennial. I deal with technology all the time. Got my smartphone with me. Got my laptop in my backpack next to me all the time. Um, so I'm kind of always neck deep around technology all the time. And a lot of my friends are older. And they get nervous when they see that they have to uh, turn on their location services on their phone. And they want to know, why is Google tracking me? Why does Google care that I go to a restaurant on 8th Avenue? And why do they want me to review it? Um, and, and my thought really around this is the more that everybody can buy into this technology, and yet it is scary, it's very scary to think that this big ominous Google is tracking you all the time. But the more that we buy into this, the faster this technology can progress and the faster that we can all be helped by it. Because that's, that's the main goal, I think. Uh, we have technology because it is a convenience for us. You know, before the printing press, people had to manually write books down. But, you know, monks and scriptorians had to copy books by hand. We went to the printing press, and that became a great convenience for us. Ty, do you feel like you are a, a fully consulted individual at every step of this little series of surrenders where you tell tell the big machine where you are and what you're doing and what you're up to? 
Is this an eyes open experience? Um, I definitely think that they make me feel that way. Now, I do know that there's got to be something else going on. You know, I mean, every little point of data from every website I visit, every cookie that gets downloaded onto my computer, I do know that there's there is a lot of stuff going on that I'm sure that I don't know about. It's it, kind of the the concept of you know, no one man can can plan a war because there's too many variables going on, and I think that's kind of how this uh, technology, technological movement is going. Now, I do think that I, I do have a sense of autonomy as far as that goes. That I, you know, they do say, do you want to turn on location settings? Yes or no. And if you want to read more into it, it's fully outlined in a document somewhere that you can access very easily. So the answer to your question is yes, I do feel like it is an eyes-open approach. Well, I think what we are seeing is that uh, we are very close to the point when corporations like Google or even governments will have so much data on us and so much computing power that they will be able to create algorithms that understand us better than we understand ourselves. And once we reach that point, authority will shift away from individual humans to these algorithms that will really know us better than we know ourselves, could understand our feelings, could predict our likes and our behavior and so forth. And um, really, it's, it's the most important question in the world today, who owns the data? Uh, we are giving up our most important asset uh, basically for free, you know, in exchange for funny cat videos and free email services. And there is a famous saying, that says that uh, if you get something for free, you should know that you are the product. Um, and I think that there is a lot of good to be done thanks to all these new miracle technologies. Uh, I talked earlier, for example, about uh, uh, AI doctors. So with the creation of AI doctors, we could provide far better healthcare to hundreds of millions of people who at present have no healthcare at all. But there is always a danger, there is always uh, a, a downside. I think in the 21st century, the really big battle about privacy and uh, individual autonomy will be between privacy and health, and health will win. Most people will be willing to give up their privacy and their data in exchange for better healthcare. Part of the problem, it's just too complicated for the individual to understand what's going on. I think that, you know, the human brain evolved in the African savanna tens of thousands of years ago to deal with the level of complexity of living in a hunter-gatherer band. And we have may might, maybe we've just reached the point in history when we can't do it anymore. The world has become too complicated. There is no way that a homo sapiens can really understand what's happening. I think really it's the first time in history, as a historian I can say with, with some certainty, that nobody, no human being and no human institution really understands what's happening now, and nobody has any idea how the world would look like in 30 years. I mean, previously in history, you could never really predict the future. Now, in 2017, you look 30 years to the future, Nobody knows what people will do for a living. Nobody knows what gender relations would look like. Nobody knows what life expectancy will be. And we don't even know what the human body will be like in 30 years. Yuval Noah Harari is with me in Boston. He's the author of Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. J2P writes, I feel this happening to myself. I'm so dependent on my GPS I find map images alien for navigation and difficult to read. I used to have a fairly keen sense of direction, and now I find orientation a struggle. Old dog remarks, it is amazing how often an on-point program has a topic that presumes some kind of linear progression in our future. The central issue of our time is our relationship to our energy sources on a finite planet. It's a pretty good bet that a lot of the stuff being predicted will never happen. Quick response, Yuval? 
Well, to, to the first uh, comment, yes, I think one of the, again, the amazing and, and terrifying things that is happening over the last few decades is that humans are losing touch with their bodies and with their senses. Uh, again, as a hunter-gatherer or even as a peasant, you needed to be extremely attentive to what you hear, to what you smell, to what you taste. If you go to the forest to pick apples and you don't pay attention, you're dead in 10 minutes. But today you don't need to pay attention. Most of our attention goes to screens, to things happening elsewhere, and we are less and less connected to our own bodies and to what we hear and smell and feel and touch. And this is a very dangerous uh, development. As for the second comment, that mo much of what is predicted will never happen, yes. Um, I don't think, as I said, nobody really knows what the future would be like. What I try to do in Homo Deus is to just present different possibilities. Some of them contradict each other, and the main idea is we can still do something about it. If there is some possibility you don't like, you can still do something about it. We are in for a very frightening ride. Yeah, there is a lot of talk today, especially in places like Silicon Valley, about uploading human consciousness into computers or creating artificial consciousness inside computers. Now, I think that uh, this is too much science fiction and uh, misses the very deep difference between intelligence and consciousness. Uh, we are developing artificial intelligence at a breakneck speed, but it's something very different from artificial consciousness. Intelligence is the ability to solve problems. Consciousness is the ability to feel things like pain and pleasure and, and joy and sadness. Now, uh, there have been immense development in computer intelligence, but so far there have been exactly zero development in computer consciousness. Computers today are not one bit more conscious than they were in the 1950s. The thing is we just don't understand what consciousness is, how it emerges, and how it functions. So I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just saying we are still a long way from developing a kind of computer consciousness. Uh, I think the real dangers posed by the rise of artificial intelligence are not what usually captures the mind of Hollywood science fiction movies. It's more things like what it will do to the job market. Uh, for example, as, as AI replaces more and more humans in the job market, and may create an immense new useless class, a class of people who are useless, not from the viewpoint of their mother or children, but useless from the viewpoint of the economic and military system. Uh, indeed, if you look at the military, there it has already happened. In the 20th century, the best armies in the world relied on recruiting millions and millions of soldiers uh, of, of common people to serve as soldiers in the army. Today, the most advanced armies rely on small numbers of highly professional soldiers, kind of superhumans, like the special forces, and they increasingly rely on sophisticated and autonomous technology, like drones and cyber warfare. And uh, as, as of 2017, most people are militarily useless. If this happens also in the civilian economy, then we are in for a very frightening ride over the next few decades. Our next stop is Concord, Massachusetts. Annie, welcome to the program. <laughs> Hi, Ray. Yeah, I mean, the implications of this on, for practical life, institutional change, education, all of it, are enormous. And we're behind times, so I think we're behind times. But I haven't, and I, I think maybe the last caller was alluding to this in some way, but or at least uh, the uh, uh, author is alluding to this, but has not, I haven't heard it directly alluded to, talked about consciousness. If, if one believes there is a soul, and I'm not a religious fundamentalist, but I'm a believer that we have, each human and it has a soul and that there's a higher soul, and if one believes in that, I, haven't, I just haven't heard anything about where that fits in all this, but I, as, a, as an aging person who sees that, particularly in the, the later parts of life, one's relationship to the idea or the sense of soul becomes extremely important or more important for many people. And, uh, and it's, it's been important for 
thousands of millennia and expressing mm -hmm. itself in different ways. Well, you know, uh, Annie, Yuval teaches at, uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem where they've been thinking about some of these questions for thousands of years, but long before he was on the faculty. Um, yes, I think to put it simply, the life sciences today don't believe in soul, and computer science also don't believe in soul. And I think what they're peddling uh, is a kind of, if you want a new religion, a techno religion, uh, they make all the old promises of religions like Christianity and Judaism and Islam and so forth, they also promise. Uh, happiness and prosperity and justice and even eternal life but here on earth with the help of technology rather than after we die with the help of supernatural beings uh, coming from Jerusalem I think the most interesting place today in the world from a religious perspective is Silicon Valley it's not Jerusalem or the Middle East my guess is that the new religions of the 21st century will emerge from Silicon Valley and not from the Middle East. We'll go next to Seal, Alabama. David's on the line. David, welcome to the program. Hey, guys, thanks a lot. I want to talk a little bit yeah, about what you were talking about a while ago, where the, uh, the wealthy people may possibly have an advantage that uh, poor people will be left behind. It's been my experience in my lifetime that, that the contrary is true. Uh, my, my dad had a pacemaker in this morning. That's why I'm not working. Yeah, it's a very good point. I think what is likely to happen is that the condition of everybody will indeed improve, but the gap between the poor and the rich will become bigger. The two things can happen simultaneously. Everybody is better off, but the rich are much, much better off. And the problem is that um, the satisfaction of people depends on expectations and comparison with their neighbors and not on comparison with their ancestors. I mean, people today, uh, even the, the, the poor people today in the U.S. are far, far better off than people were, than ancestors were 200 years ago. But we don't compare ourselves to our ancestors. We compare ourselves to our better off neighbors. And this is a very basic human tendency. And so even though the condition of everybody may become better, people may still be very dissatisfied with growing uh, inequality. And the other problem is, a related problem, is that human satisfaction really depends on expectations. And as, exp and as conditions improve, expectations increase. And therefore, humans don't necessarily become more satisfied. Uh, we today are thousands of times more powerful than our ancestors in the Stone Age, but we are not thousands of times happier. Indeed, all, indication, all indications are that people today are not significantly happier than they were back in the Stone Age. Yes, and I think the added problem is earlier we talked about humans becoming less useful militarily and economically. And what we need to remember about the health and education systems that were established in the 20th century is that they were not established just out of kindness. They were established because governments and elites needed the masses of people. Even in dictatorial regimes, like the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany, the governments invested heavily in the health and education of the masses because they needed them. They needed millions of poor Germans to serve as soldiers in the army and as workers in the factories. Now, in the 21st century, if people are less useful militarily and economically, the government and the elite will lose their incentive of investing in their health and education. And maybe in a place like Sweden or Denmark, the tradition of the welfare state will be strong enough so that the state will continue to, ca to take care even of useless people. But in a place like Congo or Bangladesh or Nigeria or Brazil, I'm far more fearful and skeptical that the state will continue to take care of people when it begins to think that it doesn't really need these people. Thank you, Bob. 
so I come from Boston, and I also am a technologist in advanced communication. So when you speak about bots and automation, and all of those points, AI, machine learning, all these different components fall into my, my realm. Uh, and what we see supporting enterprise deployments of bots and interactive communications and uh, automation like I've seen uh, happen over the years to minimize the cost for the enterprise and try and increase the customer experience. Uh, bots uh, that we found are just yet another channel to do what you had mentioned earlier, you know, which was capture data. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're willing to do in our society, and it's been happening for a few decades, is we're willing to forfeit our privacy. We're willing to give up that privacy for a better experience in a smaller package. What I mean by smaller package is if you look at the community, as I've looked at communications evolve, it's become into a shorter and shorter uh, communications path. It went from writing long letters, <laughs> to using telephones, to having uh, internet experiences, and now we're completely automated. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's happening with the bots, well, it, it's happened in the, in the past, whether it's the internet that has displaced workers, uh, whether it's call centers that have displaced workers within business, uh, communication really drives that. But the evolution of uh, capturing that data makes uh, that was a great point you made earlier because everybody is so willing to give it up. If you think that algorithms are not already created, to your point, they are. Uh, the perfect example of that is Amazon. Amazon has created these centers all over the country based on your purchases in that region so that they already have the algorithms knowing that they're going to be delivering the most commonly purchased items based on purchasing trends in the Northeast, Southwest, wherever it may be, and stocking up their warehouses so their drones can deliver them uh, in another automated fashion. So automation is coming across the board, and uh, we've seen it in communications as we deploy these bots for large, large enterprises, which you're already using as consumers. By the way. You Noah, let me get a response from you, Vaughn. Yes, I, I, I think we haven't really seen much. Uh, the future will be far more um, uh, sophisticated in this regard. I think the real breakthrough will come when Amazon will start getting data, not just about our purchases, but about what's happening inside our bodies, inside our bodies, inside our bodies. The real turning point will be when people start wearing biometric sensors on or inside their bodies, or inside their bodies, that constantly tell Amazon or Google or the Chinese government what's happening inside their bodies, inside their bodies. Like I read a book on Kindle. At present, Kindle knows well which pages I read fast, which pages I read slow, when I stop reading the book. It gives Amazon some idea about my likes and dislikes. But very soon, it will be possible to connect Kindle to biometric sensors on or inside my body, inside my body. And then as I read a book, Kindle knows, which means Amazon knows, the exact emotional impact of every sentence I'm reading in the book. And it's the same like with radio. I mean, we could have biometric sensors on our listeners, and I could know, NPR could know if it wanted, what is the emo what happens to the blood pressure of our listeners right now in Alabama as they listen to what I'm saying. Just think what kind of power such information may give uh, 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 Amazon or the Chinese government. Yuval Noah Harari is a historian at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. His new book is Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. And again, you can find an excerpt on our website, onpointradio.com. Yuval, it was great to speak to you today. I'll see you in the future. Uh, yes, I hope so. <laughs>